Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 871, The Critical Part. Deep within the primitive island, amid the pervasive white mist, Pearl's twisted face saw the gates of the Black Emperor Mausoleum swing open. A giant figure clad in black armor and a magnificent cloak emerged with majesty, with a torrent of white mist flowing between Pearl and the figure. Roselle Gustav. Pearl's face instinctively tensed, causing the mist that formed her body to collapse inward slightly. Roselle didn't spare a glance at the vortex weaver. He floated step by step into the air, reaching the edge of an abstract and ethereal strange world, like a rising mountain. During this process, the sky dimmed, and the remaining clouds twisted as if something had begun to come alive. Roselle gazed into the distance, raised his arms, and in a grand voice, he proclaimed, People of Intis, your emperor has returned. Suddenly, the clouds above were pushed together by an invisible force, swirling downwards to form another terrifying vortex. The center of this vortex was Roselle Gustav. Meanwhile, across Intis, those who still followed the order Roselle had established heard the voice of the returning emperor. Most were bewildered, questioning their ears after the recent burst of intense light, while a few turned pale, unable to believe their suspicions. To the eastern reaches of the sky, a beam of light flared up, trembling wildly as if striving to cross the vast distance and reach Roselle's embrace, causing various distortions. Behind this beam, three more beams appeared, as if pushed by an invisible force, forced to advance prematurely. In different parts of the world, some people found themselves back home despite having just left, others saw their bright cathedrals turn dark and silent, and some were habitually drinking milk but didn't notice they were using their nostrils, suffering no harm. Long abandoned compulsory education schools strangely lit up, as if filled with students quietly attending classes. Using his worms of time to search for a flaw in inevitability watch, Palaz found an exploitable point, but the worms of time he sent out disobeyed his commands. Madame Magician, who was wandering again with Ma'am Hermit and Miss Justice, found herself away from the target location instead of the sea, and in front of her appeared Madame Judgment and the little boy Will Ossipton holding her hand. The light dots within the white mist remained largely unaffected, only dimming slightly. Pearl, the vortex weaver, was first startled then showed a joyous expression. She hadn't expected Roselle to step forward, forcibly reviving himself before the ceremony's end to reclaim the Black Emperor's divine throne. Such an outcome was beyond her wildest dreams, and she hadn't even considered having Halois, the fate's attendant, weave it. But this was undoubtedly a good thing for her and the great entity she worshipped, the uncertain mist. The rewards this time will be immense, Pearl had just formed this thought when the uncertain mist she was linked to through the ritual conveyed an emotion, tightening their connection and thickening the swirling mist. Pearl sharply turned her gaze towards the villa in Trier, towards the twisted blood shadow emerging from the sacred glow and white mist. In a drifting voice, she spoke, The payment for the indulgence faction of the Rose School of Thought is the shadow of the beauty goddess a sealed artifact derived from the sequence one beyonder characteristic of the moon pathway. The one willing to offer a price for it is Madame Hart of the Nightstalkers. As Pearl's words of order echoed, another light dot rapidly expanded. This light dot revealed a secret chamber, where a vague female statue stood in the center, the walls covered with childlike figures with bird-clawed limbs, and the floor piled with expressionless humans. At that moment, a figure stood before the statue, her belly swollen, face full and beautiful, with emerald eyes sparkling like gems and brown hair neatly tied up, wearing a simple and loose white robe a pregnant woman. The lady who nurtured a deity, the twisted blood shadow from the villa in Trier, using the white mist, pierced through the corresponding light dot and appeared beside Pearl, then moved towards the light dot where Madame Hart was. It walked slowly, influenced and twisted by Roselle's resurrection. Madam, you may begin. 
Pearl couldn't change the situation of the shadow of the beauty goddess and could only ask Madam Hart of the Night Stalkers to provide the price in advance. Hart nodded gently, turned to face the statue in the chamber, and chanted incantations in a low, indistinct voice. As the incantation neared its end, the childlike figures on the walls became illusory, transforming into beams of light that entered the statue's belly. The dazed humans on the floor exploded one by one, returning as flesh and blood to the Great Mother. The female statue gradually took on a crimson glow, transforming into a humanoid crimson moon. Madame Hart then turned and made a cradling motion towards Emperor Roselle in the air. She called out in ancient Jotun, Come back, child of the mother. Blood-red moonlight seeped from Roselle's body, leaving him and heading towards the light dot where the female deity statue stood. These were the pollutants that forced Roselle to seek godhood and death, but failed to free himself from. Now, they were all drawn out, no longer affecting Roselle, no longer attempting to corrupt him. Roselle's century-old problem was thus effortlessly solved, but his current state required the corruption of the uncertain mist to balance the corruption of the Great Mother. Removing either would break the balance. In the blink of an eye, Roselle was filled with white mist, twisting the speed of passing and the distance between two points, gradually eroding the Emperor to completely corrupt him. Inside the Black Emperor Mausoleum, Bernadette saw this and, no longer calm like outside the mausoleum, anxiously shouted, Adam, where is your promise? Roselle remained unaffected by his state change, as if it was within his expectations. He continued to spread his arms, awaiting the return of the Black Emperor's uniqueness and three sequence one Bayonder characteristics. These were traits unique to the Black Emperor's true deity. Once revived, regardless of who held the uniqueness and the three sequence one Bayonder characteristics, they would forcibly return, merging with him without the need for extra rituals or potions. Crimson moonlight rose from various parts of the primitive island, coalescing with the pollutants drawn from Roselle into a miniature crimson moon-like object. Pearl's ethereal voice rang out in time. Madame Hart requested the Great Mother to reclaim the corruption from Roselle Gustave. This corruption will be exchanged for the shadow of the beauty goddess and given to the indulgence faction of the Rose School of Thought. Madame Hart caught the miniature crimson moon trying to return to the mother's embrace and pushed it out of her light dot. The miniature crimson moon entered the white mist created by Pearl, slowly flying towards another light dot. This wasn't the light dot the shadow of the beauty goddess emerged from but one guarded by a peculiar giant tree with a vague figure hanging above it. The vortex weaver, Pearl, suppressed her excitement and once again scrutinized the scene of Topsy of the School of Deliciousness, destroying the seal in the sea. In the next second, wisps of thin gray fog seeped from the seabed, cooperating with the hydra like Topsy. Trier, Botanical Garden Hearing the Emperor's return across space, Franca's lake-blue eyes widened in astonishment and confusion, with a hint of uncontrollable joy. At the same time, her spiritual intuition told her that the order here had been distorted, including the circle-inhabitant effect. And wherever there was a distortion, it meant they could escape without triggering the circle-inhabitant effect. Where is the distortion? Franca had just this thought when she saw Jenna take out a mirror and quickly perform a magic mirror divination. Jenna had a similar intuition. Meanwhile, the two Higdons, ignoring the unusual surroundings, madly attacked Lumion, who wielded the Sword of Courage, unable to focus on the two demonesses. Likewise, before Voice and Sanson stood only Ludwig, still short-legged and short-statured, unable to reach him to interfere. The circle inhabitant made a quick decision, pressing his temple, letting the gathered strange light pierce through his head. In excruciating pain unbearable even for an ascetic, he was instantly near death. The circle inhabitant effect triggered once more. Lumian and Anthony's thoughts blurred, and they found themselves back in the intact cabin, before taking out the sword of courage and black tear forehead accessory. Franca and Jenna couldn't complete their magic mirror divination in time.
Lumian instinctively took out the black tear forehead accessory, intending to throw it to Franca, but upon grasping it, he sensed the mirror world, particularly the special one, feeling the summons of Zeros and One from Morora. Is it possible to sense this way? Not before. The earlier anomaly distorted the order here and the circle inhabitant effect, causing this change meaning they could escape through the mirror world without triggering the circle inhabitant, Lumian instantly judged. He acted before Voice and Sanson could commit suicide again and bring the inevitable end, shouting to Franca and the others, Grab hold of me. Time was tight. He couldn't explain and hoped his teammates would trust him. Despite their doubts, Franca and the others, including Ludwig, grabbed Lumian's body again. In the next second, Lumian used the black tear forehead accessory and the cabin's window to enter the void dark mirror world, randomly choosing a tunnel to traverse. As expected, they didn't trigger the circle inhabitant effect this time. As joy surged in Lugano's heart, everything blurred in a topsy-turvy manner, and they found themselves in an almost completely dark world, facing Harrison from Resurrection Island. Around Harrison were four lit candles and four servings of staple food, including two loaves of bread, faina potter noodles and rice, all moldy. Harrison looked at Lumian with a slight smile. The Celestial Worthy's oracle states you carry the key part of this matter. Capturing you will eliminate any surprises. As Harrison spoke, Voice and Sanson and Higdon appeared in the darkness beside him. Voice and Sanson also looked at Lumian, smiling. Didn't you know I escaped from Fourth Epoch Trier through the special mirror world? Chapter 872 Courage Lumian didn't waste time engaging with Harrison, Voice and Sanson, and the others. This confirmed that the mirror people were deeply involved in Project Vortex, and this was indeed the special mirror world, though its specific layer was unknown. Lumian immediately activated the black mark on his right shoulder. He needed to transport Franca and the others away from this area before Voice and Sanson could use his circle inhabitant ability. This time, his destination was Morora, the city of exiles. Since they had already entered the special mirror world and the worst case scenario had occurred, there was no need to hold back. They could attempt to navigate the hidden dangers here and reach Morora. If they didn't take risks, facing Voice and Sanson and Higdon, two demigods, plus the strange and special abilities of Harrison, Lumian doubted they had any chance of survival. All of them dying was only a matter of time. It was better to take a gamble and see if they could get through the dangers of the special mirror world and reach Morora. In Morora, Lumian was the proxy of Zuzan One. He could borrow significant power, enough to counter a sequence for demigod. If necessary, he could even temporarily exert the strength of Sequence 3. With the cooperation of Franca, Jenna, and the others, and the help of Morora's Archbishop and hundreds of thousands of residents, they might repel or even kill Voice and Sanson and Higdon. More importantly, Zizan 1 repelled the approach of demigods above Sequence 5, likely causing terrifying mutations. The first targets would inevitably be those two saints, Lumian used his spirit world traversal ability obtained from the abscessed hand, leveraging his special connection with Zeros and One. Holding on to Jenna, Anthony, and the others who hadn't let go, he disappeared from the spot, transporting to some deep part of the special mirror world. Suddenly, he felt the world rejecting him, as if an invisible barrier had appeared ahead. He was forced out of the spirit world traversal state, and several figures simultaneously materialized in a gloomy, dark town ruin. The path to Morora was blocked. It seemed the higher powers within the Mirror People did this. Their control over the special Mirror World was clearly superior to the Black Tear. Lumian thought for a moment, seeing that Voice and Sanson and the others hadn't caught up yet. He immediately tossed the Black Tear forehead accessory to Franca, speaking calmly, you lead them through the mirrors, constantly shifting locations. Wait for a change in the outside world. There has already been a distortion of order. There will surely be similar anomalies soon. 
When that happens, seize the opportunity to use the mirrors to return to the surface, back to Trier. What about you? Jenna blurted out. Lumian chuckled. Of course, I'll stay and play with them. If I go with you, they'll definitely chase us relentlessly, giving you no chance to escape the special mirror world. Wouldn't that mean no one could find reinforcements? Jenna's eyes reddened, and she was about to say something when Lumian sternly interrupted. Have you forgotten your brother? Jenna's mouth opened slightly, but no words came out. Lumian nodded and smiled again. You need to find Madame Magician and Madame Judgment for me, and provide accurate coordinates. Also, you should be able to distract one demigod. He didn't hold back, smiling at Jenna, Franca, and Anthony. If I die, remember to avenge me. Jenna's vision blurred with tears. She bit her lip, nodded with difficulty, and squeezed out a word from her throat. Okay. She would avenge Lumian just as she avenged her mother. Lumian turned to Franca, his expression calm. Everything else is up to you. Franca's eyes shimmered, her voice hoarse. Okay? Lumian put on the Devil's Whispers bone ring again and continued speaking to Franca, Jenna, and the others. You are not the main target, not even secondary. While shifting locations through the mirrors, if Higdon catches up, leave Ludwig somewhere along the way. Let him hide on his own, which should buy you more time. Do you have any objections? he asked Ludwig. Ludwig shook his head, feeling this was something he had hoped for. He made one request. Can you give me more food? With his body burning with blue-purple sulfur flames, Lumian tossed some chocolate and cookies over, then spoke to Anthony. If Higdon keeps chasing, you can separate from the group. Seeing Anthony about to refuse, Lumian smiled. Someone has to stay alive to avenge us. The one who lives suffers the most. I believe you understand that? Anthony cast a placate spell on himself. Okay. Lumian didn't say more and urged them. Go quickly. Franca threw the black tear back to Lumian. The ice talisman is enough if we're just shifting locations through mirrors. The black tear can leverage the power of the special mirror world and should help you last longer. The demoness of affliction's voice choked, feeling the potion digesting rapidly. Lumian didn't refuse and quickly wrapped the black tear around his left wrist. Franca immediately took out the ice crystal-like amulet from the traveler's bag. Without hesitation, she gritted her teeth. Hold on to me. Jenna looked at Lumian with watery eyes and grabbed Franca's arm. Lugano eagerly moved to Franca's back. With a flash of icy light, they disappeared, leaving a falling mirror. Lumian turned his gaze to the three approaching figures. The enemies were closing in. Looking at Voicen Sanson, Higdon, and Harrison, with the black tear on his left wrist and the devil's whispers on his right hand, Lumian drew the Sword of Courage from the Traveler's bag. The blue-purple sulfur flames on him immediately turned a bright white with a tinge of green. His back slightly arched. His eyes deepened in color, locking onto the blonde-haired voice in Sanson, a clear smile on his face. He uttered from his throat, Actually, I've been waiting for you for a long time. Madam Magician unexpectedly reunited with Madam Judgment and will Ossipton do to the distortion effect. Straightforwardly asked the little boy, Can you lead us to the medium through which the power of inevitability is seeping? Will Ossipton, chubby-faced and dressed in a child's suit, showed a troubled expression. Given the current situation, anyone not involved in Project Vortex will be influenced by the power of inevitability, leading to inevitable failure. If I use that die, I might still be able to help you find the target but it will drain all my accumulated luck. When I get home, I might see our Roboros waiting for me. Do you have any special items that can save my luck or replace the die? I think you should. Hearing the Archangel of Fate say, should, the Magician, Justice, and Hermit began to examine their possessions, the latter understanding Will's words through Miss Justice's mental communication. Suddenly, Ma'am Hermit remembered something and produced an iron cigar case from somewhere. 
This was given to me by Queen Mystic. She said she foresaw that this item would provide critical help in the future. Madam Magician glanced at it and murmured, It carries the aura of Mr. Fool. Hearing this, Miss Justice made many connections. She sought confirmation. Did the Celestial Worthy send subordinates to participate in Project Vortex? Yes, Madam Magician vaguely understood what Miss Justice meant. Receiving confirmation, Miss Justice smiled. The Celestial Worthy participating in Project Vortex means Mr. Fool is involved too, doesn't it? So. She looked at the iron cigar case in Ma'am Hermit's hand, her voice synchronously echoing in the mind of the Major Arcana card holder. Ma'am Hermit immediately handed the item to Will. Will smiled broadly. It will do. The boy then addressed Madam Magician and Miss Justice. I'll lead the way. Though leading, Will closed his eyes. Starlight sprinkled down as Madam Magician led everyone present following Will's intuition to begin wandering. Deep within the primitive island, amid the pervasive white mist, Vortex Weaver Pearl occasionally glanced at the slowly approaching shadow of the beauty goddess and the miniature crimson moon-like corruption, sometimes at the loosening seal in the waters near Port Santa under coordinated efforts, and sometimes upward at the towering figure of Roselle Gustave in mid-air. The four beams of light on the horizon, one after another, drew closer. Pearl anticipated that Roselle would perfectly resurrect and return as the Black Emperor. In that case, the Great Uncertain Mist would reclaim one of his possessions and have a sequence zero true deity as a puppet. According to Pearl's original plan, the end of the Vortex ritual and the completion of the transaction between the Night Stalkers and the Rose School of Thought would allow the Great Uncertain Mist to thoroughly corrupt Roselle Gustav. Only then could the deceased Black Emperor be driven to resurrect. At that time, with all transactions concluded and no other forces providing assistance, the resurrection of the Black Emperor would face numerous obstructions, necessitating another Vortex. But now, Roselle Gustave had walked out of the Black Emperor's mausoleum himself, choosing to resurrect before the Vortex ritual ended. In midair, the first beam finally landed on Roselle, who was in the strange and abstract world, followed by the other three. An indescribable light suddenly burst forth. Chapter 873, The Predestined Battle In the special mirror world, seeing that only Lumion was ahead, Higdon immediately looked towards Voice and Sanson. Voice and Sanson took off a ring that looked like it was made of glass and tossed it to the demigod of the Order of All Extinction. Harrison, standing to the side, spoke in somewhat awkward intision, This world will guide you. At this moment, Lumion, engulfed in blazing white-blue flames, charged forward with the Sword of Courage in hand. After catching the glass-like ring, Higdon immediately activated it. In this almost completely dark town ruin, as if covered by something from above, various mirror-like objects suddenly lit up. Higdon's figure was then enveloped in a transparent light and thrown into one of the mirrors, chasing after Ludwig and the others. Lumion had only taken a few steps before he suddenly disappeared from the spot. Behind Voice and Sanson, a ball of blazing white-blue flame quickly appeared expanding rapidly and forming into a burning figure wielding a giant flaming sword. The circle inhabitant was not surprised. A semi-transparent figure resembling him but colder and more indifferent emerged from behind him. This was Voice and Sanson's new contract ability, Death's Summon. The blazing white-blue figure quickly dimmed as the semi-transparent upper body approached, extinguishing the flames one by one. However, Lumion himself was not within this figure. At Voice and Sanson's feet, the shadows cast by the flames came to life eerily, transforming into a sticky black liquid that seemed to condense from the darkest desires and emotions of the human heart, surging upwards. It first wrapped around Voice and Sanson's legs, then quickly spread to his torso. Desire Incarnation Lumion's previous attack from behind was merely a distraction for Voice and Sanson. The real killing move was the desire incarnation from the Devil's Whisper's bone ring. 
This allowed the various chaotic corruptions and seals within him to play a significant role in battle. So, when he teleported behind Voice and Sanson, he used the flaming figure he had created as a cover, turned into a shadow creature, and slipped into the shadows under the target's feet, activating the Devil's Whisper's bone ring from Hisoka. As for the other enemy present, the courageous Lumian did not pay him any mind. Before drawing the Sword of Courage, he had already planned his battle strategy with Ludwig. Franca and the others should be able to divert Higdon. Lumian only needed to deal with Voisin Sanson and Harrison. Though Harrison was not a demigod and lacked godhood, his abilities were strange and varied, making it just as difficult to kill him quickly as to severely injure Voisin Sanson. Thus, the primary target had to be the circle inhabitant Voisin Sanson. Lumian would rely on the quicker and more frequently usable spirit world traversal to constantly flash around, avoiding being caught by Harrison, who might steal his items or crucial abilities. During this process, the mystical plague from the black tier forehead accessory would naturally spread, covering the area. Lumian believed it would be highly effective against Harrison's paper figurine substitutes. Harrison might use the paper figurine substitutes to avoid the occult diseases, but as long as he stayed on the battlefield, he would continue to be infected. The paper figurine substitutes would eventually be exhausted, and over time, the damage rate would increase dramatically. Just as the sticky black liquid covered voice in Sanson, his body suddenly became blurry. Lumian's mind fogged momentarily, and by the time he cleared up, Voice and Sanson had already put several meters between them, showing no signs of the Desire Incarnation's terrifying corruption affecting him. This was another application of the Circle Inhabitant's ability. This time, Voice and Sanson hadn't included the entire town ruin in the Circle Inhabitant effect, only treating his own body. Just like Lumian resetting his physical and spiritual state every morning at 6 o'clock. Voice in Sanson's trigger was set to near death or when suffering a fatal attack. The Desire Incarnation attack had triggered the Circle Inhabitant effect, allowing Voice in Sanson to recover and use the brief moment of Lumian's distraction to create distance. Otherwise, he would have continued to be engulfed by the sticky black liquid. Next, a ghostly green light condensed in Voice in Sanson's eyes and shot towards the recovering black liquid. Lumian didn't have time to teleport and could only swiftly animate his shadow, swapping places with it. As soon as the beam appeared, it hit the shadow, causing it to disintegrate instantly with no room for struggle. Almost simultaneously, Voisin Sanson extended his right hand. His eyes were dyed with a silver-black hue, reflecting a silently flowing mercury river. This was the river of fate belonging to Lumian. Voice in Sanson, the circle inhabitant, intended to exchange a segment of Lumian's fate. After dodging the green beam, Lumian fearlessly teleported to Voice in Sanson's side once more. Heh, trying fate exchange? No problem. As long as I knock you into a reset, your attempt will fail. Lumian raised the iron black straight sword, blazing with white blue flames, and slashed heavily at Voice in Sanson. Call. At that moment, Harrison finally found an opportunity. He reached out his right hand and lightly grabbed, stealing this attack. Blazing white-blue flames appeared on his body, and a giant flaming sword formed in his hand. Bang! From over ten meters away, Harrison slashed the flaming giant sword at Lumian, producing a fierce explosion. Lumian, undaunted, turned to face the roaring flames and swung the Sword of Courage once more. Another call. Rumble. The white-blue flames and the terrifying shockwave clashed, the violent windstorm wreaking havoc in the ruins, lifting stones and igniting wood. Harrison was engulfed by the returning flaming windstorm, his body quickly degenerating into a sinister paper figurine with drawn features. This paper figurine surface was marked with red and yellow rust, which quickly burned to ash in the white-blue flames. As Harrison's figure reappeared at the edge of the storm, Lumian, with his enhanced physique from Zerzen 1 and the Sword of Courage absorbing damage, did not retreat a single step and locked onto Voice and Sanson again. 
His eyes turned iron black, searching for the weak point on Voice and Sanson. He raised the Sword of Courage once more, conjuring several white-blue fire ravens behind him. At this moment, thanks to Harrison's delay, Voice and Sanson completed all the prerequisites for the fate exchange. Soon, he would just wait for the time to pass and welcome the final outcome. If Lumion hadn't possessed a false angel rank, Voice and Sanson could have started the exchange directly after choosing the desired segment from the River of Destiny without taking extra time. Bang! Lumion slashed the Sword of Courage down on Voice and Sanson's head, and the white-blue fire raven circled, covering the surrounding area. You can use the Circle Inhabitant ability to restore your state, but I can target you with area attacks and delayed assaults right after you recover. A few more resets, and you will reach your inevitable end. Boom. Voice in Sanson's body blurred again, causing Lumian's thoughts to become hazy. Using the Circle Inhabitant effect, Voice in Sanson recovered from the damage caused by the Sword of Courage. However, the white-blue fire ravens continued to follow their predetermined paths, landing in different spots. Suddenly, Voice and Sanson's figure vanished from the spot. As the crows exploded one after another, the circle inhabitant's figure reappeared about 40 meters away. You may be able to teleport, but I also have teleportation from my contract. Lumian's figure quickly appeared beside Voice and Sanson, relentlessly pursuing him. His eyes turned silver black, reflecting Voice and Sanson's mercurial river of fate. He extended his left hand, pushing the illusory river of destiny towards the tributary where Voice and Sanson couldn't escape the subsequent attacks, while slashing with the Sword of Courage, creating more white-blue fireballs. Had he found the right choice, Lumion would have used Compelling Fate to directly disrupt Voice and Sanson's Circle Inhabitant effect. Rumble, Lumion's spirituality was drained by the continuous attacks, forcing him to urgently release the accumulated spirituality. Voice in Sanson was hit by the Sword of Courage and, after recovering, couldn't teleport away in time, suffering from the barrage of white-blue fireballs. The Circle Inhabitant effect triggered for the fourth time. Voice in Sanson recovered and teleported to another location. However, the Fate Exchange did not stop, as only Voice in Sanson's body and spirituality were included in the Circle Inhabitant effect, not his fate or actions. This was similar to Lumian's daily reset at 6 o'clock, which didn't undo previous actions or invalidate their results. Lumian relentlessly pursued Voice and Sanson, blinking to his side again. Voice and Sanson no longer chose to resist head-on. He used his contracted teleportation ability to change his position. On the other side, Harrison had reverted to a thin, sinister paper figurine, sensing an impending infection. Lumian continued chasing Voice in Sanson and overtook him with the time gap between teleportation and speed, finding two more opportunities to attack. However, Voice in Sanson either used special abilities to neutralize the attacks or triggered the Circle Inhabitant effect. Voice in Sanson's Circle Inhabitant seemed far from reaching its predetermined conclusion. Even with the Sword of Courage, Lumian felt a certain level of despair, knowing that the fate exchange would lead to a very bad outcome, having opportunities to attack the enemy, but unable to stop the exchange and change the impending result. This might be the meaning of inevitability. Perhaps a fate appropriator needed a circle inhabitant to unleash its true horror. Despair was fleeting. Courage once again took hold of Lumian. Chapter 874, Unsealing After a while, Voice and Sanson stopped passively waiting for the fate exchange to complete and began actively using various strange abilities, suppressing Lumian's attacks. On the other side, Harrison increasingly relied on his paper figurine substitutes to avoid the mystical plague spreading through the ruins of the town. He had little time left to interfere with Lumian, and kept trying to remove the densely packed mythical pathogens in the air with various methods he could think of, but to little avail. Lumian felt the fate exchange nearing completion. Although he wasn't afraid, he decided to take a gamble. Mimicking the bayonders of a warrior, he unleashed a hurricane of light, 
holding the Sword of Courage upside down and stabbing it forcefully into the ground. With him and the Sword of Courage at the center, blazing white-blue fireballs spread layer upon layer, covering the ruins of the town. Rumble. Explosions erupted one after another, destroying the already crumbling ancient buildings and igniting every corner of the ruins. Harrison used his paper figurine substitute again. As he was always on the edge of the town ruins, his figure reappeared in the dark tunnel they had pursued through earlier. Voice and Sanson, who was closer to Lumion, was inevitably affected. His attempt to teleport was interrupted by the violent shockwave. His body caught fire again, but the injuries were not fatal. With the resilience of an ascetic, he only instinctively twisted his face in pain. Seizing this opportunity, Lumion teleported in front of Voice and Sanson. Voice and Sanson's eyes immediately filled with ghostly green light. Almost simultaneously, Lumion, anticipating Voice and Sanson's habit and method of using the terrifying beam, half turned the Sword of Courage, holding it horizontally in front of his chest. The ghostly green beam, upon completion, shot towards Lumion at unavoidable speed, striking the Sword of Courage. The blazing white-blue flames on its iron-black blade were instantly extinguished, and its metallic luster dimmed significantly. Successfully blocking Voice and Sanson's beam, Lumion released his left hand, aiming to deliver a fatal blow. He sensed that Voice and Sanson's current circle inhabitant cycle was nearing its end. Perhaps two or three more triggers would lead to the inevitable conclusion, possibly even death. At this moment, Lumion's hair stood on end, his mind nearly blank. The negative effects of the black tear forehead accessory manifested. If not for the Sword of Courage sharing the burden, he would have been utterly overwhelmed by pleasure, rather than just briefly dazed. Taking advantage of this moment of distraction, Voice and Sanson teleported away from the emptied ruins but did not extend the distance beyond the fate exchange limit. Lumion quickly regained his senses and prepared to pursue Voice and Sanson. Suddenly, his thoughts slowed, becoming sluggish as if he had been rapidly frozen. His body became rigid, and even moving a finger was extremely difficult. The fate exchange had completed. Clang! The Sword of Courage fell to the ground, as Lumion no longer had the strength to hold it. Lumion slowly collapsed to the ground, his eyes vacant, his expression blank, leaning against a pile of rubble. No longer controlled by courage, he instinctively tried to activate the Blood Emperor's residual mark on his right palm hoping the rampant frenzy might help him break free from his current state, but he couldn't manage it. His ability to think coherently was rapidly slipping away. This was the outcome Voice and Sanson had wanted from the fate exchange. Voice and Sanson smiled, teleporting back to Lumion, and whispered, If not for your false angel rank, the fate exchange would have been completed long ago. You probably don't know that the maximum limit for the circle inhabitant cycles is nine. You're still several cycles short of dealing real damage to me. You're not truly a demigod. There's a fundamental difference between you and someone with godhood. As Voice and Sanson spoke, he pulled out an incomplete ritual sheepskin, just large enough to cover a head, intending to turn Lumion into a sheep and completely control him. In the next second, Lumion felt the stiffness in his body and the sluggishness of his thoughts easing, their effects seemingly distorted. Opportunity. Lumion immediately tried to activate the black mark on his right shoulder, hoping to teleport out of the special mirror world. Voice in Sanson's face changed. Then he activated a contract mark, shouting in a deep voice, Lumion Lee. As Lumion's figure was still fading away, his mind buzzed, his head spinning, making it difficult to maintain the teleportation effect. Voice and Sanson then placed the sheepskin over Lumion's head, chanting in Hermes, Sheep. A flash of dark light transformed Lumion into a grayish-white sheep. Most of his abilities were sealed, and the earlier state of sluggish thoughts and stiff body returned, preventing him from using the black tear forehead accessory or the devil's whispers bone ring. 
Seeing this, Voisin Sanson felt the weakness and spirituality exhaustion in his own body, but believed he could endure the mystical plague for a while longer, waiting for the circle inhabitant effect to passively activate. A sinister paper figurine with drawn features entered the still-burning ruins from the tunnel, its surface accumulating rust at a visible rate. It looked at Lumian and spoke in Harrison's voice. Your companions don't seem to have escaped either. As he spoke, the paper figurine made a gesture, and the edges of the dark world illuminated by the flames began to turn transparent, revealing the states of Franca and the others not through Harrison's magic, but through the mirror people watching in the shadows. In the mirror-like scene, Franca led the others, except Ludwia, trying to traverse out of the special mirror world. Above them, a figure in a black dress and gold crown appeared. Surrounded by white mist, a light seemed to emanate from in front of her. She glanced down, causing Franca and the others to fall back into the area they had just left, unable to escape the special mirror world. Higdon, having split into two and covered in green-yellow slime, blocked Franca and the others' escape route in the scene. After using it three more times, Franca's ice talisman only had one mirror traversal left. She did not attempt to flee again. She pulled out a set of silver-white full-body armor from the traveler's bag and placed it in front of herself. Anthony also drew the Winter is Coming revolver. In another scene, another Higdon was searching for Ludwig. Seeing this, the increasingly ragged paper figurine of Harrison spoke to Lumian with a laugh. Your companions will likely all die before you. Their mirror substitutes aren't as numerous as my paper figurines. You still have time to mourn them. Actually, you've done quite well. If it weren't for me and Higdon, your team might have been able to escape or even win against Voice and Sanson on their own. With double control over him, Lumian had almost no ability to think deeply, leaving only his emotions to resonate. His heart was ablaze with anger, indignation, and hatred, filling the sheep's eyes with bloodshot rage. Voice and Sanson turned to Harrison's paper figurine and asked, Can I kill him now to bring back Lord Termiboros? Harrison's paper figurine shook its head slowly. The celestial worthy's revelation is to imprison. Voice and Sanson thought for a moment and said, Indeed, killing this trash might trigger unforeseen changes due to the high-level powers within him, potentially affecting the entire Project Vortex. Can I attempt to unseal his chest and bring back Lord Termiboros? Harrison's paper figurine paused for two seconds and said, Yes. This did not violate the Celestial Worthy's revelation. Voice and Sanson smiled and said, I'll need you to use that Celestial Worthy's boon for the final part. Otherwise, I'd have to bring Lumian Lee to the brink of death to unseal him, which is too risky. The method to unseal Lumian Lee's The Fool Seal wasn't devised by Voice and Sanson himself, but given through a ritual by the Great Circle of Inevitability. Okay, Harrison agreed. Voice and Sanson immediately took out a black metal box and opened it. Inside were thumb-sized mercury beads, their surfaces tinged with black and inscribed with complex, fear-inducing patterns and symbols. Voice and Sanson's voice became low and his words eerily ethereal. The black-tinged mercury beads floated up, spinning rapidly in mid-air, forming a continuous river. With barely any coherent thoughts, Lumian heard Voice and Sanson and Harrison's conversation and saw the scene unfold but felt no despair or regret. At this point, despair and regret were meaningless. Lumian was only filled with anger, indignation, and hatred. The sheep's eyes bulged with fury. Son of a so. Within ten to twenty seconds, Voice and Sanson completed his chant, sending the silver-black river towards Lumian's chest. In the tunnel, Harrison had lit four candles and placed four pieces of bread in front of each, reciting incantations while taking special footsteps and gestures. Lumian quickly fell into a dark state, his thoughts gradually clearing. But before he could form any other thoughts, his chest grew hot, the familiar heat rapidly dissipating, turning cold. 
In an instant, silver black light beams burst from his body, weaving together in front of him to form a figure. Chapter 875 Response Madam Magician and the other major arcana card holders were again affected by the distortion of order, abruptly emerging from their starry roaming state and floating in midair. What met their eyes was an unusually bloody altar and countless mutilated corpses. On the altar, there was also an oil painting depicting a strange cosmos. Ma'am Hermit, whose hearing was sealed, had a twisted expression and whispered with difficulty, It's here, it's that painting. She felt the terrifying voice influencing her growing louder, originating from that oil painting. It really works. The magician cast her gaze towards the boy, Will Ossipton, who was holding the iron cigar case. It was unclear whether the praise was for the item imbued with Mr. Fool's aura or the luck she had always envied. The boy, Will, shrugged and said, I didn't expect it to be this effective either. As he spoke, Ma'am Hermit forced an ancient spear stained with mottled blood into existence, sending it with destructive intent towards the painting. But the spear of Longinus, born of fairy tale magic, disintegrated into points of light before it could reach the altar. In Madame Magician's eyes, brilliant starlight shone. Around the altar, faint glows outlined a pair of dreamlike doors, attempting to transfer the painting along with the altar outside the barrier into the deep, dark cosmos. However, the starlight doors remained motionless, unable to open. Those who are not participants in the vortex ritual cannot affect the painting, Miss Justice said, eyeing the iron cigar case in Will's hand, eager to take it and use it as a medium to showcase her physical strength and see if she could damage the painting. Madam Judgment took the lead, receiving the iron cigar case from Will and holding it in her hand, making it part of her fist. Immediately, the major arcana card holder shouted in ancient Hermes, Execution. Accompanied by this command, Judgment swung her right fist, the iron cigar case gripped in her hand. Bang! The altar dented slightly, but the painting showed no obvious signs of damage. There's some effect, but not much, Madam Magician accurately assessed. She took the iron cigar case and tried various abilities herself, but could only cause minor damage to the painting, unable to shake its core effect as they were not participants in the vortex ritual, and could only influence it through the medium the iron cigar case which lacked destructive power. Watching the painting still affecting her and many high-level individuals, Ma'am Hermit could not help but feel anxious. Deep in the primitive island, in the dense white mist before the Black Emperor Mausoleum, as the four beams of light merged into Roselle's body in midair, Pearl's face was suddenly stretched wide, presenting a comical yet terrifying appearance. The blood-red figure and the miniature crimson moon in the mist retreated strangely, as if going in the wrong direction. From the light point where the shadow of the beauty goddess emerged, the white mist, which had been nearly purified by the holy pillar, filled again. Saint Vive in Midair and the purifiers outside the villa, including Angularme, felt an impending collapse of the current order. The lightless domain instantly twisted, with some darkness seeping in, forming a shadowed side. Discovering the presence of the shadow of the beauty goddess, Mr. Moon was about to turn into crimson moonlight and illuminate the white mist, but found himself rushing into the sky. The worms of time split by Palas, just deciding to return, assess the situation, and unite in deception, got lost in life's path. Mr. Hanged Man, riding the gale, suddenly plummeted, nearly losing his flying ability and falling to the ground. As distortion phenomena appeared to varying degrees worldwide, at the core of the vortex ritual, Pearl struggled to raise her head and look up. At the edge of the abstract, fantastical world, Roselle's figure, clad in black armor and a luxurious cape, grew larger and clearer with a crown set with dark gems forming swiftly atop his head. The surrounding white mist mostly invaded his body, distorting his face, with his eyes a deep blue almost black, a slow expanding mist. The Black Emperor had revived in the astral world. 
Roselle lowered his head slightly, gazing down, focusing on the white mist before his mausoleum, the torrent connecting him and the mist, and the face of pearl in the depths of the mist, exuding majesty and depth. The next moment, the black emperor raised his right hand, forming a fist, and gently twisted his wrist. Distortion He forcefully completed a distortion using his authority, the black emperor pathway, the special connection with the uncertain mist, and the corruption deeply eroding his body and soul, relying on the invisible barrier blocking the outer deities. Pearl, deep in the white mist, briefly lost focus, then discovered in shock that the great uncertain mist was no longer closely connected with her through the vortex ritual but had shifted to the Black Emperor. Her object of faith, her ritual foundation, had all been distorted to Emperor Roselle. After her initial confusion, Pearl quickly felt a surge of fear and despair. Not only her, but all the uncertain mist believers across the continents also saw a thin white mist before their eyes, with a majestic, indistinct figure standing within. That figure, wearing a crown and black armor, quietly looked down at them. The Black Emperor's first act upon revival was to temporarily take over all faith directed at the uncertain mist. Of course, this also exposed him more directly to the outer deity outside the barrier. Another wisp of white mist separated from the surface of a planet, reaching the site of an intense divine battle, using the special environment and its symbolism to penetrate the barrier again, falling upon Emperor Roselle at the edge of the astral world, like a fishing line finally controlling its target. Roselle's expression became increasingly distorted. He continued to gaze at Pearl and the uncertain mist believers worldwide, speaking in a majestic voice, the broker can unite the outer deities and has acted, posing a great threat, a crime beyond pardon. As he spoke, the Black Emperor's outstretched right hand opened, as if to grasp something. After declaring the crime, his right hand clenched abruptly. Bang, bang, bang. On the northern and southern continents, the uncertain mist believers exploded into blood mist. This was not the ability of the Judgment Domain, but the control granted by the Boon System, the control of an evil god over his followers. Temporarily distorting the uncertain mist faith, Black Emperor Roselle used this to purge the evil god's followers, making them feel the wrath of a god, aiming to eliminate them all. A single broker might not be dangerous, but their ability to weave all dangers together made them the greatest threat. No! Despite her desperate resistance, Pearl exploded uncontrollably within the white mist. Her face split into different parts like the nose, eyes, mouth, and ears, scattered into the white mist, staining it with a noticeable blood color. Yet the vortex ritual had not ceased. The shadow of the beauty goddess and the miniature crimson moon continued to approach their target light point, even faster than before. Silently, the exploded uncertain mist believers, in blood mist form, crossed the void, merging into the vortex mist that Pearl had become. This accelerated the advance of the shadow of the beauty goddess and the miniature crimson moon, sustaining the ongoing transaction as if other forces were maintaining the ritual. A characteristic of the vortex was that all participants contributed power to maintain the ritual until their part of the transaction was complete. Thus, once the vortex was formed, destroying it would become increasingly difficult. Roselle glanced at the white mist connecting him and the outside barrier, his expression of pain growing more apparent. He shouted lowly, Adam, where are you? The uncertain mist has made a heavy bet. If you don't reveal your cards, we're all doomed. Seeing no change around, Roselle paused and continued to roar angrily, Adam, are you really waiting for a chance to devour the eternal blazing sun and others? Just after Roselle's low roar, a distant yet gentle voice echoed in his mind, I'm here. In the special mirror world, Voice and Sanson watched expectantly and reverently as silver black light beams shot from the gray white sheep that Lumion had become, waiting for Lord Termibros to be completely freed. The beams wove together in front of him quickly forming a figure. The figure was slightly hunched, 
wearing a black classical robe and a pointed hat of the same color, with a thin face, slightly curly black hair, a broad forehead, and pitch black eyes. Just as Lumian was about to activate the Blood Emperor's residual aura to try and escape the sheep state, he froze upon seeing this figure. W.H. Voicen Sanson and Harrison's bodies trembled, also becoming stunned. The figure slowly straightened, not even glancing at Voicen Sanson and Harrison, but turned to look at Lumian. Without any warning, the sheep's wool covering Lumian's body fell off, shrinking back to its original head covering size. Lumian remained in shock and bewilderment. The figure took out a monocle made of crystal and leisurely placed it over his right eye, revealing a slight smile at Lumian, you can call me Ammon, or... The figure's voice grew majestic and layered, the smile on his face more evident. Termiboros, 